Um, I'm going to give a short presentation to tell you um, what the hell a supercomputer is and why you should care about what it is. Um, before actually my colleague Andreas and I will go with you to our supercomputing center, which is the white building with the round part over there, um, to look at the supercomputers. Yeah, I think I thought maybe the easiest starting point for this school is to start with something that you've heard of already. So I think you have already had um, a talk by Markus Axa today morning about polarized light imaging and fiber architecture. And if not, it will be tomorrow. Um, and you might know since this talk, or you will get to know soon, that um, for polarized light imaging, the brain is sectioned into ultra thin slices. <laughs> um, these slices are then captured tile-wise under a microscope. And then there is a very complex software-based reconstruction workflow to finally extract single nerve fibers from this data. Um, well, you might hear about big data in media, publications, at conferences, and PLI is really a big data case. So if you look at the numbers, there are one and a half thousand or even more sections per brain, depending on the cutting direction, um, hundreds of tiles per section, uh, about 2,000 times 2,000 pixels per tile, and this all adds up to about 750 gigabyte or more for a single section. I guess you know the size of the hard drive in your computers. That's probably a terabyte, maybe two if you're lucky. So there is no way you could work with that data on your computer unless you look at only single tiles because you're interested in that detail. But you would never find the tile you're interested in because it has to be somewhere and you need some viewer at least to find the area you're interested in. And I work with that data in my master thesis already. Um, and what I did there is that um, I was responsible for one of the tools in this reconstru uh, reconstruction workflow, which was uh, image segmentation. Um, and I put that uh, on one of our supercomputers that we had at that time at Ulich Supercomputing Center. If you would run this image segmentation, so detection of brain and background regions in the image so that you can cut away the background, um, on a normal laptop with one a single CPU, it would take about one year to process an entire brain. We've never done that, so this is really, you measure how long it takes for two sections and you add up how much it would be for, for a full brain. There is no way you would do that. If you use a graphics card in addition, which was possible for that algorithm, it's already 15 days, so that's almost doable. But if you use a bit more, let's say 64 processors and 64 graphics cards, which compared to the, the size of a supercomputer is it's a tiny fraction, it's less than a working day. So instead of waiting a year for your results, you could do it in a day. And this is all what supercomputing is about. So getting things, results faster than you would typically do it or making things possible at all because there is no way, I mean, you would have to store these hundreds of terabytes of data somewhere on a, on a big archive and then get one section to your computer, process that, copy it, the results back, get the next one, process it, copy it back which is doable, but you don't really want to do that. Another example is more another area in neuroscience modeling and simulation. Um, this is a recent paper from, I think, March or April this year by um, the group of Markus Diesmann, who is in the neighboring institute here on campus, and uh, collaborators in Japan. Um, and they simulated a neural network with half a billion uh, neurons and almost six trillion synapses on Ukraine, which you will not see later because Ukraine has just been replaced by its successor. Um, and this simulation, so simulating is one second of biological time on our previous supercomputer took, a sec took uh, five minutes, which is okay. It's still far away from real time, of course, but at least you can wait for the results. Um, if you had tried to do it on a standard computer, I think for the calculation they used the quad-core computer, so very standard hardware, it would take two years. And there is no way you would actually put this neural network that you simulate on your, on your computer because if you have six trillion synapses, that also means that you need to store all these six trillion connections. So which neuron is connected with which one, uh, which parameters do these connections have? So all of this has to be stored somewhere and there is no way you could put that in the main memory of your computer as well. So if it was possible to simulate that, it would take a y uh, two years. So this is why you really, neuroscientists start using supercomputers more and more because for different areas, um, 
everything related to imaging with high resolution images, um, brain simulation, um, uh, modeling and then simulation um, for detailed simulations or for high resolution data, there is not really a way around it. Um, I don't know what your backgrounds are, but I think it's very mixed as usual. So for those of you who've not that much of a computer science background, a standard computer has some components which I'm sure you've all heard of. So there is the hard drive or an SSD in very modern computers, mostly notebooks, that's like the archive. So where all your data, your documents, your games, your whatever programs are stored when you don't use them. Um, there is a processor which is the brain of the computer which does something with the documents like that's the, the thing, part of your computer that runs your Word, your Excel, your games, whatever you do with it. The main memory is like the desktop, so all the all documents or data that you use are at the time you use it copied from the hard drive or from the SSD into main memory. That's orders of magnitude smaller than the, than the hard drive, but much faster. Typically computers have a graphics card as well, or at least some graphics accelerator chip, chips in notebooks. Um, and as the name says, that's for everything graphical, so video games, but you can also use them as I did in my master thesis for um, image processing because it's designed to do that, so they're very fast and efficient. And then there are some more things like the main board, that's like the central control unit which decides which data to copy from the main memory back to the hard drive or the other way or um, what the processor should do next. Uh, then there are some other things which might or might not be in a computer, sound cards, um, CD, DVD, Blu-ray drives, and a lot more, depending on what the computer should do. And you have some periphery. Um, you need a monitor, a keyboard, a mouse, speakers, printer. Well, now let's look at what a supercomputer is, in contrast to that. The components are almost the same. It's just that you have a lot more of them. Um, you, I'm sure you've all seen images of supercomputers, like the one in the bottom right corner. So it's black or gray boxes, sometimes with fancy pictures on them, sometimes not. Um, they are called racks or cabinets, depending on the supercomputing center. Um, though in these black racks, there are note boards, which you can see at the top. So things which you can put in and take out and on which all the different other components are installed. So you can see in the top right that there are several different cards plugged into this note board. Uh, and each of these note boards has typically multiple nodes. And every node has then more or less the elements that a normal computer at home also has. So you have um, typically some kind of hard drive or SSD. There are already supercomputers where that's elsewhere in the system, but typically there is some, some let's say, storage as well. There are one or multiple processors. These have typically multiple compute cores, so the actual units that compute something. Um, and this adds up to a lot. So typically, high performance computing systems or supercomputers have 10,000 to 100,000 of compute cores. Whereas your computer at home is a quad core, so it has four or maybe eight. So it's hundreds of thousands of more of compute power. And that's where the, the power of the supercomputers comes from. Well, and all the other elements also need to be in there. Some supercomputers, like ours, which you as you will see, will also have graphics cards or other let's say, special compute units um, on the nodes, but in principle it's the same, just everything exists hundreds, thousands of times. Um, what's not in there are sound cards, Blu-ray drives or monitors. I mean, in this room there are monitors, but like one at the side, maybe for the administrator. But you typically log on from your computer somewhere in the world. Um, what the supercomputers have in addition to a normal computer is a very fast network because somehow these nodes have to talk to each other. So if you simulate a neuronal network across multiple nodes, of course, they somehow have to exchange information. And there are the network is also the very expensive part of a supercomputer. Um, and there are special node types, for example, uh, nodes, login nodes. So you log into such a login node and that then spawns your job across the system. Um, management units for the administrators to check which node is broken, for example. Because you can imagine that when you have hundreds of thousands of cores that sooner or later some of them will break. Well, for using such a supercomputer, the principle is very simple. It's divide and conquer. 
So you have your problem, let's say a huge image that you want to analyze or a neural network that you want to simulate and you divide this problem into sub-problems. Um, then you distribute these sub-problems to the cores, compute cores, to graphics cards, to the compute unit units in your system. Let them uh, solve their sub-problems as, as, as far as, 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 as it is possible. And s at some point they have to exchange information typically because well, naturally, if you imagine that you dis divide a neural network into 10 parts and distribute them to 10 compute units, there will also be spikes coming from one, one part to another, because otherwise it will be 10 completely independent networks. And at the end, you most likely have to combine all results into a like, global result. Um, the way how you can distribute your problem uh, is often domain decomposition, as I've just said, for you divide an image into sub-images or for PLI you have millions of images so you just distribute the millions of images to compute units. There are different ways to do it. There can be timely composition as well. Um, if you have iterations over time and the, ti the iterations are more or less independent, you can also parallelize in that direction. And there can be parameter studies, which is something also done in neuroscience. So um, you can have... Um, for example, when you start modeling a neuronal network, you have to find out which start configuration you need so that the neuronal network exactly shows the behavior that you want to simulate. Um, and for finding this perfect start configuration, you might have to run the same simulation multiple times with different start configurations, which you could also run in parallel. There is no way not to do that. Or you do the same analysis with different parameters or you use different algorithms and this could also run in parallel. So what we do in the Human Brain Project is that we work together with five supercomputing centers in Europe. So we have our supercomputing center over there um, here in Germany, the Swiss National Supercomputing Center, um, Cineca in Italy, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center in Spain and CEA in France. And all of them operate large supercomputers, so they are among the largest in the world, um, for science. So all of these supercomputers are accessible for European researchers. Um, that means we host these systems, we operate them, but there is an independent process organized by PRACE, that's like the union of all or like the club of, of supercomputing centers in Europe. And scientists can write a proposal, describe what they would like to do, so which science they would like to do. They have to describe that in principle they know what they are doing, that they can use the systems efficiently because of we want to use, get mo mo the most out of science, let's put it that way. Um, and then praise as like an independent organization decides who gets access based on, well, if it makes sense scientifically and if it's technically possible. Um, and so we have actually not just people here from Jülich on our supercomputer, but we have people from all around Europe on our supercomputer. And the same applies to the other centers as well. Well, it would be boring to just say, hey, there are five supercomputing centers and now we are in HPP. But what we do is that we build a software infrastructure around these already existing supercomputers. Um, and this software infrastructure then allows to run simulations, um, to do everything with data that you want, so um, to analyze it, to image processing, um, and also to exchange data with project partners, for example. And a very important topic for us is to help scientists in the Human Brain Project, but also other scientists that are interested in that, to manage and run complex workflows where you, for example, have a simulation running, and you would like to see how this this network behaves. So what doth, does a spike pattern look like? Does it behave in the way I, I want it to behave? Um, and so we work on connecting the simulators with visualization tools so that you can use this visualization tool to look at a running simulation and for example change a parameter or stop the simulation, start it again, so that you don't have to wait for hours until you see that something went wrong. Um, and to make it easier for scientists to use the supercomputers, we also built um, what we call middleware, so that allows to access the supercomputers in a more uniform way. Uh, the Human Brain Project has the collaboratory, that's our web portal, 
And you can go to into this web portal if you have ex an allocation on a supercomputer. And from this web portal, you can submit your jobs, so do a simulation or run an analysis on one of, of our supercomputers, independent of which supercomputer you actually use. So you can use the same APIs, the same mechanisms to do it uh, independent of the system. Of course, you still need to know which system you use because they are all they have a different architecture, but the way how you do it is much more uniform. What we also did in the last years is that we talked with a lot of neuroscientists and asked them which hardware do you actually need. So what would you like to do and then try to find out with them um, which hardware they need and it turned out that neuroscience has some requirements which are different from for example physics. And so we built together with Cray and with IBM and Nvidia in a long and complex process that the European Commission um, has in place for such activities these two pilot supercomputers, which are also in our supercomputing center here. And they are accessible as part of our high performance analytics and computing platform, so of the HPP. And neuroscientists in the HPP can directly get access. They don't have to apply for access, they would just say, I would like to use it, they get an account and they can um, work with them. You can see that they are much smaller. So this is the entire Euron system and the entire Julia system. It's just one small rack, but getting access is much easier and the, the architecture is a bit different from the other systems that we have. Um, and at the time we got them, which is I think three years ago already, two or three, um, they had hardware installed, which was so new at that time that we were not allowed to publish certain details for the first months. Well, as I said already, what we build in the HPP can be used for very different things. So you can um, do image processing with it, which is uh, done a lot by this institute here, so the Institute of uh, Katrin Amons. Visualization is something which um, our part of the Human Brain Project does together with neuroscientists, so we help them uh, with their simulations and develop tools for them, uh, brain simulation and data analytics. Um, if you are interested to get your hand on it and try it, um, there are different ways to do it. Julia and Euron are there, at least for some more months, because they are also getting old. Um, getting an account for them is comparably easy, at least if you work for an HPP partner institution and you can just start playing around. We have a lot of tools pre-installed, so for example the Nest Simulator, um, Neuron, um, but also FSL, which is uh, an imaging library. Imaging library. Um, but also other parts of the Human Brain Project, for example, the neuroinformatics platform, the brain simulation platform, they build on what we've, we've done. So it might be that you use um, tools of the brain simulation platform that actually run on our infrastructure. But maybe before you can do that, if you have never done anything in that direction, you also want to attend some more courses. Um, we will organize two platform trainings. Uh, one, the first will be this year in December, uh, the second, and the details will be announced very soon. The second will be in the second half of 2019, so probably between October and December next year. We also applied for hosting an education workshop next year. Uh, it's not decided yet which will be funded, but um, we might even think about doing it if we have to pay for it ourselves. We'll see. Um, and there are a lot of training courses available. Um, typically the requirement is that you have some programming knowledge because otherwise using a supercomputer is not really possible um, but this is just some courses offered by our supercomputing center here but also our other partners offer similar or very different courses um, and two offered this year still are for example porting code from MATLAB to Python so if you've learned how to use MATLAB in your, at your university this course would tell you how to move away from MATLAB to Python because MATLAB cannot be used very efficiently on our supercomputers. Um, you can also, there is another one which is called Software Development and Science, which is a bit more general and it's more about um, how to develop software properly so that later on you will have an easier life. So how to structure your code and what to keep in mind when you de start developing a new project so that um, you and your colleagues will have a lot of fun with it and uh, it's not too painful. And there are a lot of courses related to uh, using the supercomputers. Um, in the one in the top right, uh, bottom right corner, Introduction to Parallel Programming, is like the very basics when you start using a supercomputer. The one in the top right is a bit more advanced. 
Um, but there are also more special courses like uh, parallel and scalable machine learning. So using machine learning on a supercomputer. Yeah. Are these open courses? Yes. So all these courses are on the website of our supercomputing center and all of them are open. There are like one or two per year which are just for employers, but you, will, you won't find out about them because they are only internally announced. So all of them are open. Uh, attendance is almost always free. You would just have to pay for accommodation. It's usually between one and three days, depending on the, on the course and throughout the year. So the first ones are, they really like from January to December. And on the website, first you only see the courses which are still coming up, but you can also see what was earlier this year. And typically the same course, which was this year in April, will also be next year in April. So if you have more questions, we can maybe talk later after the tour. Yeah. And if you have more questions, you can also write down that email address and just send us an email. And we can tell you more about it or take a picture of it.